Hi, I'm John Mather, Nobel Prize Laureate and Senior Scientist for the James Webb Space Telescope at NASA, and you're listening to The Soul of Life. Dr. Ellen Langer walks into a grocery store and is about to pay for her groceries when the clerk asks her to sign the back of her credit card. Dr. Langer, a Harvard researcher on the science of mindfulness and possibility, complies and signs the credit card receipt. What happens next has been one of Dr. Langer's punchlines from countless stages across the globe. The clerk compares the two signatures to see if they match. Mindlessness is pervasive. Virtually all of us, almost all of the time, are not there. But when we're not there, we're not there to know we're not there. Dr. Langer spoke with me on The Soul of Life about her work on the science of possibility, where she's widely credited with research that kicked off the positive psychology movement that came into vogue in the late 90s, and the mindfulness revolution that followed in the 2000s. Langer's most famous work was in her 1979 counterclockwise study. Although it was a small study not rigorous by today's standards, its results foreshadowed a generation of psychology research. In the counterclockwise experiment, Dr. Langer took eight men in their 70s, men not suffering from significant health problems, but dealing with typical limitations of their age. And she dropped them into a retreat together where they entered a time warp of sorts. Old time singer Perry Como crooned on a vintage radio. The Ed Sullivan Show played on a black and white TV. Everything inside, including the books and reading material, were designed to conjure 1959. In this period of time, as short as a week, Old men, uh, we found that their hearing improved, their vision improved, uh, they looked noticeably younger, their memory improved, and so on. The, the effects were astonishing. Men were instructed to behave as if it were actually 1959, while the control group lived in a similar environment but didn't act as if it was the past. In her career as the longest tenured professor of psychology at Harvard, Langer went about publishing over 200 articles on topics such as the placebo effect, illusion of control, and mindfulness. Mindfulness, as I study, it doesn't require meditation. It's very, very simple. Um, it's the act of noticing new things. That's all you have to do. And when you notice new things about the things you thought you knew, you come to see you didn't really know them as well as you thought you did, so your attention naturally goes to it. In 2010, the BBC revived Langer's 1979 counterclockwise experiment with a reality show that followed former celebrities as they participated in a recreation of the Turn Back the Clock retreat. The show went on to win a BAFTA award, the UK equivalent of an Emmy. In fact, Langer's counterclockwise study so captivated the media in wider culture that actress Jennifer Aniston had announced she'd be acting as the 34-year-old Langer in a film Aniston would also produce. I had a good time with it. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> I spent time with Jennifer. She's delightful. While the film about Langer never left the development stage, she did get written into an episode of The Simpsons, when Homer's depressed and sick father is rejuvenated by immersing himself in the 1950s charm of a vacation in Havana. <laughs> so now I know I've made it. <laughs> You've made it. Would you care to go for a ride? Car keys that don't go bloopity bloop. I'm home. Dad, let me help you out. <laughs> I don't need no help. Oh, but it do to tea. A lung full of leaded gas, and I'm better than ever. <laughs> oh, oh, thank you. You've taken my dad back to a simpler time when our only worry was being obliterated by nuclear weapons. It is the car. All our American cars were built before 1960. And studies show that exposure to objects from your youth can help you feel young again. Homer Simpson even pokes at the study's validity, something that shadows Langer's catapult into pop culture. What studies? Are they peer-reviewed? You know what they are? A professor, Ellen Langer, did a study where seniors exposed to culture from the 50s became more vigorous and engaged. I assumed that Dr. Langer, someone with a 25-year bestseller titled Mindfulness, would be 
really excited by the surge of interest in mindfulness meditation and the integration of mindfulness concepts into education and healthcare practices, things that we would have never imagined five, 10, or even 15 years ago. But after speaking with her and getting a taste for her deadpan humor and no BS approach to teaching, her reprimand for my mindless assumption still rings in my ears. Can no, include no, an, uh, no. a learning process. No, you, you're saying no, something no, quite no, different. No, not at all. Quite different. Yeah. Why does she think that placebos are the strongest medications we have available for treating disease? So when you take that sugar pill and you get better, the question is, well, what's making you better? And the answer is you're making yourself better. A, a good deal of our research is devoted to getting rid of the sham. You don't need somebody to give it to you. You don't need to make believe it's effective. You can actually control your own health. We talk about her wildest hope that mindfulness could be found to play a role in spontaneous remissions of terminal illnesses, something very controversial, and her belief that schools are the biggest perpetrators of mindlessness. Schools teach us that there are absolute right answers and that what we need to do, and we tell students, memorize the answers. We talk about what really makes us happy. It's not what you expect. Welcome to The Soul of Life. I'm Keith Miller. This is season two, episode five. Ellen Langer, the mother of mindfulness. I'm Keith Miller, and my podcast, The Soul of Life, is here to help you remember who you really are. I'll bring together people who have gotten off their treadmills. I'll have conversations with athletes, musicians, doctors, scientists, healers, and entrepreneurs to discuss the fascinating edges of our knowledge in neurobiology, psychology, and physics. This is the soul of life. Please take the time now to subscribe to the soul of life wherever you're listening. Give it a thumbs up or write a positive review. That's the best way to make sure you don't miss out on these amazing episodes planned for season two. Dr. Ellen Langer is a professor in the psychology department at Harvard University, where she's been the longest serving professor of psychology and the first woman tenured, tenured in that department. She's been described as the mother of mindfulness and the mother of positive psychology and has written extensively on the illusion of control, mindful aging, stress, decision making, and health. She's the founder of the Langer Mindfulness Institute and consults with organizations to foster mindful leadership, innovation, strategy, and work-life integration. Her many books, best-selling for uh, quite a while, written for the general and academic readers include Mindfulness, The Power of Mindful Learning, On Becoming an Artist, an Artist and Counterclockwise, Mindful Health and the Power of Possibility, which we'll talk about today. Her most recent book, The Handbook of Mindfulness, is an anthology that brings together the latest multidisciplinary research on mindfulness. It's a real privilege to have you here, Dr. Langer. Welcome. My pleasure. Well, um, I wanted to jump right in and, and talk about mindfulness. It's been the story of your career and the, the passion of your career. Tell me how you first got into this, and I suppose we should define mindfulness for those listeners who may be new to this subject um, and listening for the first time. I noticed not infrequently that I would do things like I'd walk into a mannequin in a store and I'd apologize uh, for getting my keys, which is my father's biggest um, sin, we'll say. And um, so I just started paying attention to people, uh, smart people, not seeming to be there. And uh, then I moved up to, I was teaching at the Graduate Center in, um, in New York. And then I moved up to Cambridge and I thought, well, Cambridge, Harvard, you know, all of these super smart people, surely you won't find this. And then I found because I was coming from New York, there were things that would happen. Like um, I would look for a parking space. It's 3.30 and the banks used to close at three o'clock. So I'd park at the bank and nobody ever did that. Um, I go into a bank um, when it was open and uh, there'd be eight people on one line, five on another, and then there'd be a teller without anybody um, in front of him or her. And so it seemed that uh, this mindlessness was pervasive. That started a lot of the research, which um, over more than 40 years has shown me that mindlessness is pervasive. Virtually all of us, almost all of the time, are not there. But when we're not there, we're not there to know we're not there. It's something so common, you can see it every day all over the place. But not in yourself. A lot of the work that I've done, the initial work all started with the mindlessness of ostensibly thoughtful action, where people seemed to be thinking, but they weren't. 
And this happened at the time when the field of psychology was mired in the belief of what was called the cognitive revolution. And so I said, wait a second, before we spend all this time thinking about what people are thinking, we might want to take a step back and see, are they thinking at all? And as I've already said, the answer was a resounding no. Um, and although I did uh, some of the very early work on meditation, um, I quickly switched to mindfulness without meditation. Tell me about that. I'm curious because it's it's such a big, um, it, uh, some people have called it a revolution, this idea of meditation and mindfulness, John Kabat-Zinn, yoga. Yeah, no, I, yes and no. Meditation is not mindfulness. Meditation is a practice you go through to result in post-meditative mindfulness. And But mindfulness, as I study, it doesn't require meditation. It's very, very simple. Um, it's the act of noticing new things. That's all you have to do. And when you notice new things about the things you thought you knew, you come to see you didn't really know them as well as you thought you did. So your attention naturally goes to it. This act of noticing is the essence of engagement. And we have lots of data showing not only that it's easy, but it's energy begetting, not consuming. And would you say um, it's, it's different from education? Um, my, my wife's a teacher. Um, how, how is it different than education and learning? Keith, it, it is so different that <laughs> I don't know where to begin. Uh, I think that schools, we'll leave your wife out of this, but schools in, gener in general are the biggest perpetrators of uh, mindlessness. Schools teach us to be mindless. Schools teach us that there are absolute right answers and that what we need to do, and we tell students, memorize the answers. And so I, I was a straight-A student, as you might imagine, Harvard, Yale, all the way through. Okay, then I go to this horse event not that many years ago, and this man asked me, can I watch his horse because he was going to uh, get his horse a hot dog? Well, the reason I bragged about myself, Harvard, Yale, well, yay me, uh, was because I knew without any doubt, horses don't eat meat. They're herbivorous. Okay, he, so, you know, so basically he was asking me to do something that was ridiculous. But I said, yes, nonetheless. He comes back with the hot dog and the horse ate it. And it was that moment that I realized that everything I knew could be wrong. So it was very humbling. Right. Now, schools teach us uh, to, uh, to act as if the world is absolute. And what we do is we hold it still, thinking that gives us some control um, over ourselves and over the world. But it's that very holding thing still, when in fact everything is varying, that costs us mightily in terms of our health, our well-being, um, our um, efficacy, and so on. So it can include a sitting practice, a meditation practice. It can no, include no, an, uh, no. a learning process. No, you, you're saying no, something no, quite no, different. No, no, not at all. Quite different. Yeah. No, meditation is a practice. Meditation takes work and it takes time. I'm talking about a way of being. Mm -hmm. And that once you recognize that you don't know, and we can never know because everything is always changing, everything looks different from different perspectives. But when you know you don't know, then you naturally tune in. But too many of us are taught to hold things still and think we know. So if I were giving this lecture to a large number of people, I've done this so many times, and I would say, okay, so Keith, how much is one in one? Or you'd say two. No, one in one is only sometimes two. If you add one wad of chewing gum to one wad of chewing gum, one plus one is one. Add one pile of laundry to one pile of laundry, one plus one is one. In fact, in the real world, one plus one probably doesn't equal two as a more often as it does. So it really if depends using, on, the, on the frame and the context and, and, always, and absorbing more of the detail, more of the frame. Well, the context, the context. That behavior, the meaning of behavior depends on the context. And when we learn something, memorize it or take it in as absolutely true, we ignore the way things change depending on context. So as it relates to our thoughts, for example, mental activity, should we believe what we think? It depends on what we think. If we, if we believe that we know, then no, we shouldn't believe yeah. it. So we should have, have one foot grounded maybe in uncertainty, perhaps. Yes, more than, more than a foot, I'd say. Uh, at least the, both feet and uh, an arm and three, you know, and, both ears. And a tail. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, the idea is, the point is, that everything is always changing. Everything looks different from different perspectives. So you can't know. And the problem is that people believe that they should know, so they pretend. 
And so interactions are often disingenuous. Um, People are stressed in those interactions, fearing that they're going to be expected to know something they don't know. Uh, But uh, so it's very freeing to realize nobody knows. It really is. It really is. Right. You can't know. So could I know whether or not the horse was going to eat the hot dog? Uh, No, I couldn't know one way or the other, because even if I knew that sometimes horses eat meat, I still wouldn't know if this was one of those times. Right. Right. We we tend to, it seems like you're saying in your teaching is that we tend to gravitate towards certainty and rigidity of thinking. And that if at all possible, you're challenging people and the research you've done shows this, that when you challenge people to look for something new, something happens. What is that? What happens? Well, so the first thing is, you know, you have lots of well-meaning people who say things like be in the present. And that's very sweet. It's just ineffective because, as we've already said, when you're not in the present, you're not there to know you're not there. The way to be in the present is this active noticing. And as you're actively noticing, the neurons are firing and our data show that it's literally and figuratively enlivening. But as you're actively noticing, since you are in the present, you're able to take advantage of circumstances to which other people are blind and also avert the danger not yet arisen. You you talk about I believe placebo effect. What what are the dangers of of this? Um, of of how often it's discarded? It's usually just thought of as a, a something to write in the in the in the notes of research. Nobody pays attention to placebo. Why is that a problem? Well, well, it's a it's a very big problem because placebos are probably our strongest medication. But if you think about placebos, what is a placebo? So somebody in a white jacket usually gives you a pill. You believe that pill is going to cure you, um, but the pill is inert. To be a placebo, it means it has no medical efficacy. Um, So when you take that sugar pill and you get better, the question is, well, what's making you better? And the answer is you're making yourself better. So a, a good deal of our research is devoted to getting rid of the sham. You don't need somebody to give it to you. You don't need to make believe it's effective. You can actually control your own health. And what a difference that makes. I mean, um, can you describe, this leads us, I think, naturally to to your turn back the clock study. Okay, so yeah, uh, some of these studies are designed to show uh, the power of the mind indirectly. So we'll start with that. But then let me tell you, since you can't easily fool yourself, uh, how one can, in fact, improve their health. Um, The counterclockwise study was based, it was the first test of uh, this mind-body unity idea. It is very simple and saying mind, body, these are just words. Let's put them back together and back together. Then wherever you're putting one, you're necessarily putting the other. And that actually explains placebos. You know, you take that placebo. Now your mind believes, you believe that you're going to be healthy and health results. So what we did to test this mind, body unity was to uh, retrofit a retreat so that it seemed as if it was 20 years earlier. Okay, we had uh, posters, all the furniture and everything was of that early. Nostalgia of the uh, 1950s or something. It it was, um, we did this study in 1979 and the, um, so it was 1959 that we were simulating. Mm -hmm. And we brought old men to this timeless retreat to embody their younger selves. So they were supposed to live for the week as if they were 20 years younger talk in the past about the present, you know, talk about the past in the present tense. All the activities they engaged in were as if it was only 1959. We had a comparison group also live in the same retreat for a week, um, but for them, they were just reminiscing. Now, um, this, this study was sort of remarkable in, in many ways. And I can say that about my own work because um, it uh, has now been described in the Simpsons go to Havana. Okay, so now I know I've made it. <laughs> but anyway, made it. Uh, in this period of time, as short as a week, old men, uh, we found that their hearing improved, their vision improved, uh, they looked noticeably younger, mm. their memory wow. improved, and so on. The, the effects were astonishing. Um, to happen at all, no less in only a week. I mean, it's something like he- like hearing improvement, right? Something like yeah. that where, where most people would say is objectively a function of mind speed or a processing speed or something like that? Hearing and vision, most people presume that as you get older, you get um, 
uh, your hearing and vision both uh, diminish, mm -hmm. and that the only way it's going to improve is with some medical intervention. And this is not a medical intervention. So that was the beginning. And then we've done several studies since. I, I can describe a couple if you're interested. Sure. There was one with housekeepers? Yeah. So um, we uh, took chambermaids and we first asked them, how much exercise do you get? And they say they don't get exercise. And that's because they think exercise is what you do after work. And they're just too tired from their work. And we simply told half of them, taught them, that their work was exercise. That working at a gym, you know, um, uh, making beds was similar to doing this or that, um, exercise at a gym, and so on. So at the end of this, we have two groups. One group who doesn't realize their work is exercise. One group who's now changed their minds about that. As a result of this change in mindset, we found that they lost weight, there was a decrease in waist to hip ratio, body mass index, and their blood pressure came down Wow! just by changing their mind. Wow! In a more recent study, we have type 2 diabetics. We test them, uh, we give them many tests before the experiment starts. They sit down at a computer. Next to the computer is a clock. You'll understand why in a moment. They're asked to play computer games and change the game they're playing every 15 minutes or so to ensure that they look at the clock. For a third of the people, the clock was going twice as fast as real time. For a third of the people, half as fast as real time. For a third of the people, real time. And what we found was that blood sugar level followed perceived rather than real time. In another study, we have people in a sleep lab. They wake up, they see the clock, I'm big on clocks, uh, the clock tells them that they got two hours more sleep than they got, two hours uh, fewer, or the amount of sleep that they got. Again, the perceived amount of sleep determined biological and cognitive functioning. So, so it's, it seems as though the results would indicate that our programming, our perception of our disability, let's say, or, or our lack of fitness or something, actually is what conditions or uh, creates part, the response yes. Yes, in the body. To a large extent, yes. Wow, I mean, it, what, what's this? Here, here's what I, I guess, one of my questions for you is: uh, when I teach mindfulness, I get up in front of people and say, "Look, you know, mindfulness has done so much." When we we try to talk about, it, and I mention you all the time, I mention your your research and kind of ask people, to, I'll do a couple experiments as you as you often do with people, and, and ask them, you know, and show them how how simple it is to begin to be mindful. Mm -hmm. But then I'll say to them, and I'll turn around usually because I I have a bald spot in my head. I'll say it doesn't cure baldness. <laughs> and I'll say, I'm sorry to break it to you, but it doesn't cure cancer. Now, well, we don't know that. We, tell but, me about this. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't think we have any idea just uh, uh, to the extent of, of all of this. I think it goes far beyond what most people believe. So uh, as I said before, and answers the question you just asked now, I want to tell people about how they can um, help cure whatever diseases they have. Okay, and uh, hair growth, maybe I'll put that on the list. For oh, please. Our, our, next, our next set of studies. <laughs> Could you get started, yeah. So when you're diagnosed with some terrible disease, um, or even that you're stressed all the time, let's start with stress because this goes through many, many disorders, that people who are stressed think they're stressed all the time. No one is anything all the time, and certainly not to equal measure. All right, so, but what happens is that the moments you're not stressed, you're not paying any attention to your stress. So you're just living. Then you're stressed again. So you're, you're there when you're stressed. You're not there. <laughs> you're not stressed. You're there again. It seems this is happening all the time. The key to health, oddly, is not noticing when you do have the symptom, be it stress, pain, or whatever. It's to notice when you don't have it. But typically now, when people don't have the symptom, they're off doing whatever they're doing. Right. So we called people at random times throughout the week, people with a host of disorders, multiple sclerosis, uh, ALS, chronic pain, arthritis. We're doing it now with uh, stroke. Uh, we have data with um, Parkinson's disease. I mean, big things, right? And in each case, we find the same thing. So let's stick with your stress to start. So you think you're stressed all the time. I call you at random times. I say, hi, Keith, how do you feel right now? And is it better or worse than before? Mm -hmm. And why? And there, it's never going to be the same. So the first thing is you're going to see, gee, it's a little better or even it's a little worse meant the last time wasn't as bad as you thought it was. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
So by thinking you're stressed all the time and now seeing you're not stressed all the time, you're going to feel better. Right. Then the next question is, well, why? And so then you have to start paying attention to the world around you. So you might see, you know, well, when I'm talking to Ellen Langer, I'm stressed. And when I'm not talking to her, I'm not stressed. Well, if that were the case, the cure is simple. Don't talk to me. Right. So the answer begins to reveal itself. One of my teachers is Dr. Richard Schwartz, and uh, he's one of your colleagues at Harvard, uh, the founder of Internal Family Systems Therapy. And a lot of these therapies are moving towards, like Bessel van der Kolk's therapy for trauma, the, uh, an integrative, what we would call an integrative model of the mind. And it seems like that's what you're describing, that even trauma, of course, fragments us and help and causes us not to pay attention or to disassociate. Right. It's, it sounds like there's there's a parallel here in some of these. Well, modalities. sure. I mean, even the, the name since 1979, I've been talking about mind-body unity. Mm -hmm. So mind-body unity and mind-body integration don't sound to me very different. Right. Um, right. It's, so, it's about time. I mean, our right. <laughs> like some of these expensive um, surgeries and psycho or pharmaceuticals, I mean, some of these things that we, we turns out I mean, I think we have to be careful when we speak about this. We have to tell people to consult with their doctors and and, and, yeah. and follow well, treatment also, recommendations. But there's but Keith, more. The, the main thing is that there are no sec, uh, negative side effects. What's the harm, right? Right, exactly. What's so the um, and what's the harm and the upside is enormous that we found. It, it, it is. Um, and then what, also yeah. that e even if you can't, you know, uh, can't figure out why now is it better or worse than before, the very act of trying to find out tends to be mindful. And yeah. again, the 40 years of research shows that that itself is good for your health. That, that itself. I mean, I came across some research and I wonder if you're familiar with this. Um, the, 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 the act of, because I teach this and I, I want to make sure it's, it's valid, <laughs> um, that the act of, of noticing something new stimulates some of the same parts of the brain that, uh, that we get when somebody notices us. When somebody gives us a hug, sure. attachment, the, the attachment circuitry, uh, that seems yeah. uh, so powerful. It's like you can yeah. give yourself a hug. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we have some brand new data that um, I probably shouldn't talk about yet, but why not? <laughs> um, because that has been validated uh, more than once. But anyway, it's incredible. Uh, we have somebody will be sitting, uh, sitting down and we give them index cards to read. And the index cards say things like, Mary had a little lamb. I love Paris in the, the springtime. And we ask them to read them. And they read, I love Paris in the springtime or Mary had a little lamb. They always overlook the repeated word. Mm. Now, when the experimenter, not talking to them at this point, is simply mindful, you see the double word. There is a way that, yeah, that's it's sort of incredible. Um, that's and why someone I have else to near you it. is being mindful. That exactly, exactly. Yeah, so mindfulness is contagious, but let's, you know, let's whisper that rather than shout it from the rooftops at this point. Oh, yes, please, especially now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Um, wow. What are what are some of the results of of what you've looked into with people with cancer? And I, I want to ask you about Alzheimer's. Is that something you've you've looked at? Yeah, well, um, you know, we were going to do this big uh, counterclockwise study uh, with cancer. In fact, it's almost embarrassing because it was the cover of the uh, New York Times magazine section several years ago. But we never did the study because we had to get permission from the country of Mexico, uh, Harvard, and uh, the universities that the oncologists were in. It was just, it just took too long. Yeah. Um, to do all of that, but we're we're aiming to do it now with a virtual reality. But the idea was to bring women with breast cancer back in time to the time they didn't have the tumor, do the uh, medical tests, the MRIs, and whatever, and see if the tumor went away. We don't know many of the things that uh, the medical world proclaims, and I think that oftentimes um, it becomes a self fulfilling prophecy. If you think you're going to die. Not only do you not do things that would extend your life, but you sort of get your body ready. Uh, right. right. And, and we know this, uh, anyone who works in, uh, around infants, anyone who's had infants knows the, the, the mortifying, literally, uh, st statistics that came out of the 40s and 50s when children in some of these isolated uh, hospital wards were, uh, uh, newborns were not allowed to be touched. You know, there's no, of course, with a baby, yeah. the mindfulness seems 
so obvious or the they, the baby baby seem to demand it don't they um yeah you either pay you have to pay attention to what's happening to me or else i'm going to scream or else i'm not going you know so um it, our body seems to light up when we are paying attention to it lots of people um uh, these days think they should have an attitude of defensive pessimism hmm. and defense you know which is um uh expect the worst and hope for the best hmm. and with respect to everything you know, that's going on. And I think that's wrong in two ways. The first is, um, well, you get what you expect, essentially. And there are decades worth of research in psychology and social psychology bearing that out. So you want to be careful of what you expect. Otherwise, you're, if you uh, aim for the ground, you're going to hit it. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Because you don't see, you're not there to see alternatives. And, um, but um, the surprise when I started to think about this before I wrote about it was the hope. Everybody thinks hope is good. I'm sure before I started this, you thought hope was good. I, before I thought about it, I thought hope was good. And then hope is better than being hopeless. Hmm. However, hope has built into it, again, an expectation for failure. You don't wake up in the morning and say, I hope when I get to the kitchen, I can get a cup of coffee. Mm -hmm. You just assume you're going to get a cup of coffee. Right. And so during the, the times of uh, COVID, what I've been um, arguing for is that people, instead of um, defensive pessimism, adopt a style of mindful optimism. And that means you, know, you don't put your head in the sand. There are real things that are happening. Right. But what you do is you make a plan. You know, so your plan is you're going to choose your pod, you're going to quarantine from everybody else, uh, you're going to keep social distance, wash your hands, wear a mask, whatever it is that you decide to do, and then you just go about living. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, in the going about living, you're building up your resources so that should anything happen, you're better able to deal with it, but also that your your life tends not to be bogged down with stress. And for me, um, I don't have um, data that is strong enough to make this claim, but uh, I, I'll explain why I think this and uh, still gathering data. I think that the biggest cause of virtually all illness is stress. Mm. So I wanted, I was going to do this research with people in China, but you know, now uh, everything has changed. Yeah. Um, where we take people who have just been diagnosed with the worst of all diseases. Okay, so pick, pick your favorite. We can use cancer since you brought it up before, but it could be anything. And we, when anybody is first diagnosed, nobody turns around and says, oh, wonderful. <laughs> okay, so let's yeah. give people you know, a, a week um, to start to deal with it. Then things should, uh, should change depending on your stress. So the argument that I'm making is that over time, those people who are the most stressed will um, manifest all of the terrible aspects of the disease, independent of diet, medication, genetics, so on and so forth. All right. So, um, uh, so for me, during this time with the pandemic, when people are so easily stressed, it's very important for them to take a step back because stress buys us nothing. And stress relies on two assumptions. The assumption that something, um, that something um, is going to happen and prediction is an illusion and that when it happens, it's going to be awful. Hmm. And so is it going to happen? Well, if you've been taking those steps that we've just said, the, the likelihood of anybody getting COVID, very, very small. If you're quarantined, you're washing your hands, you're wearing a mask. Um, and second, that if you do get COVID, now this is going to be hard to swallow, but there's actually an upside for many people. Now, and most people, again, don't die of COVID. You're not saying go out and don't take your mask off. You're not oh, saying no, that. no, not at all. No. Not at all. Uh, uh, quite the contrary. But what I'm saying is that, you know, there's some data um, I think it's with people with strokes um, uh, that, and, and uh, also cancer, that when people are given these diagnoses, all of a sudden they come alive. Mm -hmm. You know, most people are sealed in unlived lives. And so you get something that all of a sudden makes you realize, gee, 
uh, life is not going to go on forever. You, you better start to change your priorities and start living. Start living. Um, mm-hmm. I, I, a lot of people were writing about is there life after death. I had considered writing a book about is there life before death? Because for <laughs> too that. many pe- for too many people, um, again, they're you know uh, they're they're not fully alive. There's a lot of ways to die, and some of them include while we're living. <laughs> right. Exactly. Um, Please take the time now to subscribe to The Soul of Life wherever you're listening. Give it a thumbs up or write a positive review. That's the best way to make sure you don't miss out on these amazing episodes planned for season two. Have you ever been in the same room or or met uh, Captain Sully Sullenberger, the the pilot of that plane that landed on the Hudson River? I mean, it sounds as though you're you're saying that we can can have a life um, and be present to what's happening, not over-prepare. But when something happens, something horrible happens, and you you have no engines, you have your health is taken from you. It's a catastrophe. You have the presence of mind to use what you have to go right. where you need to go. Right, and you know, and people can practice this um, in a, a very small way. You know that um, you know you're cooking, you're about to cook a dish, uh, bake a cake, or do something, and you don't have an ingredient. And so you can say, oh, I can't do it. You can bemoan uh, that it's not going to be as good. You may even end up better. Or you can say, what can I use now? So I don't have sugar. Maybe I can use maple syrup, honey, whatever. I don't have sour cream, it's yogurt, and so on. I'm the king and, of doing that. We're, we're out of yeah. powdered sugar. Well, is there a way to make powdered sugar? Sure enough, you can yeah, make exactly. powdered sugar. <laughs> sure, sure. And it becomes much more fun. And what people, you see, people are more, people are more likely to take the step that we're suggesting, whether it's um, uh, an accident happening in the air or um, you know, in the kitchen, by recognizing that the way we've been taught to do things is only one of several ways. We have options. And, uh, right, and what happens is that when you're taught the way to do things, you tend to lock yourself in, that that's the only way, so if that way doesn't work, oh my goodness, rather than saying, well, right. let me shift gears. Right. Um, I, I want to jump back to teaching for a second. It's not, it's not my specialty, but I, I want to bring this up for the educators that, that are out there. A lot of us parents have been stressed out by what's called the common core curriculum, which in math especially, you know, math is now being taught. Um, and I know this is not either of our expertise, but I'm just curious to go, go down this road a bit that, that some of these curriculum choices are being made, it seems like, to include uh, not telling the students the answer, but giving them exactly like you're saying, the options to get there. So in math, for example, I cannot help my kids because we were taught one way to do it. And yeah. now they're being taught, well, see what you can do with this. And well, see yeah, and that sounds, no, that sounds great. I'm suggesting something even beyond that because I'm suggesting not multiple ways to reach a single answer, but multiple ways to achieve multiple answers, recognizing that the answer we need is going to depend on the context and it changes. You know, the the whole world right now is set up to solve uh, uh, today's problems with yesterday's solutions. And typically they don't work. We're gonna need more than that. Yes, right, exactly. I I know I run a risk in saying this and losing half the audience, but um, the advantages to the pandemic, you know, you get a chance to see what matters to you. I think we need to hear that. I'm grateful. Well, yeah. once you choose to engage something with a simple process of noticing, it comes alive for you. Right. Let me give you an example. We did this very simple study where we had people who were going to do um, things that they don't like. Uh, we had women watching football, uh, people looking at art who didn't en- appreciate art, people listening to classical music or listening to rap music, a-, a-, a number of things. And for one group, we just had them do the activity. For another group, we had them just notice one thing about it. For another, three things. For another, six things. Mm-hmm. And what we found is the more they noticed, the more they liked the thing that they noticed. Anything you do can be done mindfully or mindlessly. And it leads you in a very different place if you, if you do it mindfully. Even something, mm-hmm. some of the tasks that you were mentioning with people stuck at home, you know, that uh, I noticed how when I was young that doing the dishes at a friend's house 
uh, or a friend of my parents' house or whatever was always fun. I always felt very noble, you know, but doing my own dishes didn't feel that way. Well, mm -hmm. the same dishes, you know, so then I started doing the dishes so they were fun. No matter right. what you do, right. you need to make it interesting. Right. And the good thing is that as you do this with more of your mundane everyday tasks, um, the more exciting being home is, the less you miss being out. And I think that what will happen when um, all of this passes is that many of the things that we've done mindfully at home, ways of being will last beyond, you know, I, that it's not, this is what I'm going to do now. I'm going to Zoom with people now. But um, uh, once this passes, I'm, you know, I won't bother with Zooming. Right, um, right. Sometimes it takes these, these, uh, losses or tragedies for us to change patterns. And we, like you said, you, reali you realize that there's energy that flows out of this growth and investment of, of uh, the burst of activity that you need to do to get to do something new. Yeah. Um, I'm super grateful to spend time with you and appreciate your hard work, your, your entire career. Um, you've won many awards. I want to just remind people about the books that, that they should read. Some of them, many of them are bestsellers. Mindfulness, of course, 1989. Uh, 97, The Power of Mindful Living, um, more recently on Becoming an Artist. And then um, I believe this is your latest uh, counterclockwise, or is there one more recently? Well, there's a, a book called The Art of Noticing, which um, is uh, like a coffee table book. It has my paintings and one-liners that have been culled from research um, on each page. And um, that's only available at Amazon. Love Thank it. you for asking. Yeah, that's, that's yeah, the, on uh, my the list mindful now. the mindfulness book um, uh, has a 25 year anniversary edition. Fantastic. So, I mean, it's a bedrock piece. Uh, anyone in the field of psychology, anyone who's not in the field, I think needs to read it too. But um, 25 years, congratulations on that. Mm -hmm. um, is the film starring Jennifer Aniston still in the works about <laughs> <No>. you? <laughs> no, but Thank it was you. a lot of fun. <laughs> I spent time with Jennifer. She's delightful. Um, yeah. Uh, what was most fun about that, apropos of nothing that we're speaking of, is while that was going to happen, um, where Jennifer uh, was playing me, and um, it was going to be a takeoff on part of uh, Counterclockwise and then more um, drama. <laughs> and uh, so I'd go to a party. And then this was before Jennifer was going to play me. Everybody would decide who should play me. <laughs> Oh, but fun. that wasn't the most fun. The most fun was then they should they were all deciding who should play them. And I, you know, I, <laughs> it wasn't clear to me why they were going to be in the film. Yeah, right. <laughs> so I, I had a good time with it. But um, as I've been told since, most films in uh, Hollywood don't end up getting made. Right. Um, right. So we'll see it. You know, it's not over till it's over. I, I would vote for it and I would go see it uh, every day. Really nice to spend this mindful time with you. Thank you, Dr. Ellen Langer. Thank you, Keith. This was nice. Thanks for listening to The Soul of Life. This is Keith Miller. Oh, and don't forget, please leave a thumbs up or a like for this episode wherever you're listening so that others like you may find the soul of life. I mean, really, it's not every day you get to share the soul of life with someone. Okay, so you can post a comment or question on souloflifeshow.com. I'd love to hear from you. And please subscribe now to get the next episode. I look forward to sharing more of my soul of life with you. I like it and it's not harsh to my eardrum. All right, I will go.